So the first lesson is uh, the Old Testament lesson, and it's from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of fire of the bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he answered, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this holy mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, this you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The gospel lesson is from the gospel according to John, chapter 8, verses uh, 21 through 30, and Jesus is in conversation with the like scribes and the Pharisees in Jerusalem at this point. Again, Jesus said to them, I am going away, and you will search for me, but you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Then the Jews said, is he going to kill himself? Is that what he means by saying, where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will all die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. They said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, why do I speak to you at all? I have much to say about you and much to condemn, but the one who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but I speak these things as the Father instructed me. And the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do what is pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Here ends the reading. In 2019, I was able to go on a trip to South Korea with youth from the Connecticut Conference of the UCC. The, the conference has a partnership with Presbyterian churches in Korea there. And the main purpose of the trip was to build fellowship among Christian youth from completely different parts of the world. And it was also just a chance to experience a different culture. And an aspect of Korean culture that quickly became apparent was the attitude towards shoes. 
There are strict rules about taking your shoes off inside the house. There are special slippers to wear inside the house, and then there are even special like sandals for just the bathroom. And in addition to taking off your shoes when entering a home, you'd often take off your shoes inside other buildings too. The church buildings we spent lots of time in, you wore your shoes in the main hallways, but you took them off when you'd go into an office, for example. And I unknowingly picked the worst pair of shoes for this trip because uh, I picked a pair of sneakers that I couldn't put on without doing up the laces, so I was constantly lacing and unlacing my shoes dozens of times a day. Now, while we were in Korea, I was invited to preach a number of times. And the Sunday I was preaching the main worship service, I was wearing pumps as my shoes, because that seemed good for church. And I was informed right before worship that when I'd go up to the chancel, I'd need to take off my shoes and put on sandals to go up onto the chancel. And the chancel's like the front part of the sanctuary. But there wasn't really time to do that, so you just had to like process down like we do, and then immediately like jump out of your shoes and put on the sandals. And uh, so that was quite stressful as a, a thing. And I was really trying to do this gracefully, and uh, I did not succeed doing it gracefully because like good fitting heels like don't fall off your feet. Like that's like part of it. So anyway, I wasn't very graceful, but I didn't fall because I was wearing a robe and everything. So I considered that a success. And then at the end of service, you had to walk down the steps, jump out of your sandals and put back your pumps and continue processing down the aisle. So that was the part that stressed me out more <laughs> during the service more than anything else. So I found this kind of puzzling. So later on in the day, I asked one of the, the Korean pastors why they took their shoes off to go into the chancel to lead worship. Uh, taking off your shoes in other places was about keeping things clean and keeping the shoes at the threshold made it easy to clean up when there was dirt or mud. So that all made sense, but that didn't make sense for taking off shoes in the middle of church because the chancel was in the middle of the room and it was the same type of flooring as everywhere else. And the pastor told me, we take the shoes off because it's, it's like Moses. So the Old Testament lesson this morning is Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush. And one of the very first things God says to Moses is remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. So taking shoes off at the chancel and at the burning bush is about showing respect and respecting a place as holy. And holiness in scripture is literally about things being set apart, things being different. So the encounter Moses has at the burning bush is something holy. It's something different. Reformed theologian Karl Barth describes God as being holy other, meaning that God utterly transcends the realm of human experience. On one level, we human beings are not capable of fully understanding God, who is beyond our limited comprehension. But at the same time, talking about God as holy other highlights God's grace. It highlights the, the grace that this holy other God chooses and decides to interact with humanity and to reveal himself to us. And the fullest revelation of God is the incarnation, Jesus Christ. But this scene with the burning bush is another major moment of God's revelation. It's a moment where humanity is told important things about who God is and what God is about. Now, at this point in Moses' story, he's fled to the wilderness of Midian to avoid being executed for murdering an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew slave. Moses has started a new life, gotten married, and had a son. But one day, Moses is out with the flock and sees a bush that's on fire, yet is not consumed. And as Moses turns aside to investigate, God calls out from the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses answers, here I am. Now this pattern of God calling someone's name twice and that person answering, here I am, happens a number of times in scripture. And it's usually when God is about to call people to do some important things. In this case, God is calling Moses to be who's, who God is going to work through to set the Israelites free and lead them to the promised land. And it's at this moment where we learn that God cares a lot about slaves going free and the oppressed being released. 
Now, Moses rightly figures this whole liberating people from the Egyptian empire business is going to be hard, dangerous work. So Moses protests, who am I to do this? But God replies with, I will be with you. This is an assurance that Moses isn't going to be alone. God being with us is one of the most consistent promises in scripture. Each time people are faced with time of transition, the constant assurance from the Lord is, do not be afraid, for I will be with you. Joshua is told God will be with him wherever he goes. Gideon is told God will be with him when he needs to lead the Israelites to victory. God says, I will be with you throughout the books of the prophets. One of God's most steadfast and repeated promises is the promise to be with us. Now we need only look at scripture to know that the promise to be with us isn't a promise that things will be easy. It's not a promise that things won't get hard or that everything will go the way we plan. It's not a promise that we'll always get what we want or that we'll always be in the right. It's not a promise that we and those we love will always be safe. And it's not even a promise that we will never die. But it is a promise that God loves us and will never leave us. And it's a promise that whether we live or whether we die, we belong to God. There's no part of life or death where we will be separated from the presence of God or the love of God. We are never alone. So Moses is promised God will be with him. But Moses needs some further assurance. And he knows he's going to be questioned when he goes down to the Israelites. And he asks, like, when people question me, who shall I say has sent me? What's the name of this God who has sent me? And this is when God reveals the divine name. And God's name tells us some interesting things about God. Now, the name is somewhat difficult to translate, but the most common English translations are, I am who I am, I am that I am, or I will be who I will be. Now, one reason God's name is difficult to translate is because ancient Hebrew is actually written without any vowels. The oldest Hebrew manuscripts are just consonants. And most of the time, this is fine because of how the Hebrew language is structured. And also because when people spoke ancient Hebrew in daily life, they knew how to pronounce everything. But one of the difficulties with translating from ancient Hebrew manuscripts is that occasionally it's not clear which vowels go with a set of consonants when there are multiple options that work. Now, with God's name, the consonants are Y-H-W-H, which is kind of a unique variation on the Hebrew verb to be. And based on biblical names that seem to be based on God's name, there's pretty universal consensus that God's name with the vowels would be Y-A-H-W-E-H. However, Jewish tradition has referred refrain from pronouncing God's name out of respect and in reference to the commandment prohibiting taking the Lord's name in vain. So a practice developed of saying Lord, which in Hebrew is Adonai, each time God's name occurred in scripture. And eventually it became traditional to avoid writing the divine name as well. So Lord came to be used as a placeholder in written documents. And following from this, once Hebrew came to be written with vowels, devout scribes didn't want to risk people pronouncing God's name. So they didn't want to put all the letters in there. So instead of putting the vowels that would go in God's name, they instead put the vowels for Lord, Adonai, in. So if you take the consonants of God's name and the vowels of Adonai in English pronunciation, you get the word Jehovah. So if you've ever wondered where the word Jehovah came from as a name for God, and you need to win at very specific trivia, now you know. It's the, the consonants of God's name with the vowels of Lord. So what do you, I think that's really neat. And I, I promise I'll get to something that like relates to your life in some way, but I have a couple more things I find interesting. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> 
So there's a, a lot of Jewish tradition about how the divine name is written, and this directly influences how our English translations of scripture work. So if you pick up most English Bibles, there are times where the word Lord and sometimes a few other words are written in tiny capital letters. And those tiny capital letters are to let the reader know that that word is actually God's name in Hebrew. And for the most part, English translations follow Jewish convention and replace the divine name with Lord. So that's why there are all those tiny capital letters. It means it's God's name there. Okay, so now we'll look at something relevant maybe to your life. <laughs> so what's important about God's name for us is that it's a verb. It's uh, basically the verb to be. God's name is directly tied to existence, to creating things and doing things. God self-defines as all that is and all that will be. And it's even reasonable to translate God's name as something like he who brings things into existence. So this tells us some fundamental aspects of who God is. God created things, God creates things, and God will create things. Essentially, God is, God's name is a verb that indicates God has done, is doing, and will do things in the world and beyond all that we see. The divine name basically means God is up to something and has made everything. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. In the gospel according to John, Jesus very directly tells people he is God through referencing the divine name. There are numerous times in John where Jesus declares, I am, without anything following it. And uh, our English translations unhelpfully render this, I am he, to make it work in English, but that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is referring to the I am of God's name. And uh, the New Testament lesson is a chunk of John with a, a couple instances where Jesus is making this point to the Pharisees, asking who he is. And Jesus says, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am. You will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. Am. Jesus is telling people that he's the God who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. He's the I am, the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. So God created the heavens and the earth in seven days, but there's also an eighth day of creation in Christian tradition, the, the resurrection. And that's why uh, baptismal fonts are shaped as octagons because uh, it's the eight days of creation, and it represents the, the life we're being baptized into. So God's name is directly tied into creation, into bringing things into existence. It's a name that tells us about the boundless possibilities of God, and in the resurrection we can see God's promise of continuing creation. Our God is living and active and capable of so much more than we imagine. Our God made everything out of nothing, brought life out of death, and makes the impossible possible. And it's that ever-creating, ever-working God who was with Moses and who is still with us today, wherever we might go. Amen.